since humans first walked on the earth, we have gazed and wondered at the night sky. And one of the oldest sciences, astronomy, still seeks to answer the fundamental question, what is our place in the universe? Early star watchers realized that most of the stars moved together across the sky, but others went their own way. These were called the wandering stars. In ancient Greek, planistai, the planets. Throughout history, people have found many ways to explain the mystery of the night sky. Some imagined that it was a blanket with holes that let in the light of heaven. The Navajo of North America believed that the god Sohanoi carried the sun on his back and at night hid it behind the west wall of his house. The Japanese believed that the moon was born from a tear shed by the god Izanagi. But what science tells us about the birth of the solar system is also astounding. Five billion years ago, from a swirling mass of cloud, the sun was born. At its center, the heat and pressure triggered a nuclear explosion that has been going on ever since, the source of the sun's energy. At the same time, the outside of the cloud began to form into the planets, dense, rocky ones nearest the sun, and at the far reaches, much bigger creations, mostly made of gas. The Sun, with the nine orbiting planets, became our solar system. The Sun is big enough to hold more than a million Earths. From the surface, raging at over 5,000 degrees Celsius, giant solar flares leap tens of thousands of miles into space. Distances in space tax our imagination. A passenger jet traveling the distance from the Sun to the edge of the solar system would take over 800 years. Even in a science fiction spacecraft traveling at the speed of light, the voyage would still take over five hours. To reach the nearest star at the same speed would take four years. Heading out from the sun, the first planet is the tiny battered Mercury. A sphere of rock the size of our moon, Mercury is a planet of dramatic extremes. The sun's massive gravitational pull has robbed it of nearly all its atmosphere. During the day, the temperature quickly rises until it's hot enough to melt most metals as if they were wax. But at night, with no protective atmosphere, the temperature plummets until it's as cold as liquid nitrogen. The sun's gravity attracts passing asteroids and meteors. Close by, Mercury gets battered and scarred with huge craters. Mercury only takes 88 Earth days to orbit the sun, giving it the shortest year in the solar system. But it spins on its axis so slowly that its day, strangely, lasts twice as long as its year. Since its solar orbit is so short, it passes through our night sky with great haste. So in the Roman pantheon, Mercury was the messenger of the gods, a symbol of agility and speed. Viewed from the Earth, the planets helped to govern our sense of time. The solar system provided a calendar to tell early humans when to sow the seed and when to reap the crop. For travelers and sailors too, a knowledge of the heavens provides a reliable direction finder. With eyes as their only telescopes and minds as their only calculators, ancient people still managed to map and record the heavens. 6,000 years ago, the Chinese made detailed records, data that's still used today. 
they predicted celestial events of great significance to the emperor and his court. Phases of the moon, the positions of the planets and eclipses, all with unerring accuracy. They had to. The punishment for being wrong was instant execution. In early cultures, the astronomer was half scientist, half magician. After all, someone who could predict when and where the sun would rise could surely foretell other events. Astrology, fortune telling from the positions of the stars and planets, still thrives. Even monarchs and political leaders have consulted astrologers when making important decisions. The second planet out from the sun is Venus. Named after the Roman goddess of love, it's a symbol of all that is gentle. It's the brightest planet seen from the Earth, often visible at dawn and dusk. It's been called the morning star, the evening star, the dragon star, the witch star. But the beauty of Venus is deceptive, with conditions more awesome than any dragon, more terrifying than any witch. Its brightness comes from a toxic atmosphere reflecting the sun's light. A mixture of carbon dioxide and sulfuric acid suffocates the planet in an extreme form of the greenhouse effect. A computer can simulate a flight across the surface of Venus, a surface whipped by colossal storms with hurricane speed winds and a rain of burning acid. Lava flows come from what appear to be permanently active volcanoes. A brimstone and sulfur world, the nearest thing to hell. Land a familiar object on Venus and it wouldn't last very long. Acid rain and extreme temperature would burn holes through the metal. And before long, high winds would blow it away. A real challenge for an exploring probe. Only one has survived long enough to transmit data back to Earth. A Russian probe was specially strengthened to withstand the awful conditions. Even so, it lasted no more than an hour. The Earth is about the same size as Venus and not much further from the Sun. So why don't we fry in lava flows and choke on sulfuric clouds? Part of the answer is that on Earth, there's life. Four billion years ago, the Earth was much like Venus, with immense volcanic activity shrouded in carbon dioxide and water vapor. As the Earth matured, the water vapor cooled and it rained. Rain enough to create the oceans, the birthplace of primitive life forms. These microscopic creatures began to break down carbon compounds, essential ingredients from which all life is made, releasing oxygen into the atmosphere. This began to work as a heat control, so avoiding the extremes of temperatures found on Mercury and Venus. The Earth's surface now teems with life. Life has shaped the planet. It's made our atmosphere and covered our land masses with forests and cities. Life has done more than colonize Earth. It's become part of its very structure. Humans had no way of seeing the beauty of planet Earth itself until we saw it from space. One of the most compelling sights in the universe, it moved astronauts to tears. Long before humans had ventured into space, movie makers were acting out fantasies of space travel. Flash, they're turning toward attack. Throw it in me face. Flash Gordon, Buck Rogers, and many others thrilled a whole generation with their adventures. Yes, it's our only chance to save them. Not until 1961, when the Russian cosmonaut Yuri Gagarin orbited the Earth, did fantasy begin to become reality. So far, the moon is the only extraterrestrial site on which humans have set foot. In 1969, Apollo 11 took Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on their half a million mile round trip. Flight controllers, go now, go for landing. Retro. Go. Fido. Go. Guidance. Go. Capcom, we're go for landing. Eagle Houston, you're go for landing. Over. Contact light. Okay, engine stop. We've had shutdown. 
Tranquility Base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. There have been six moon landings during which astronauts collected rock samples, took photographs, played golf, and easily showed that moon gravity is one-sixth that of the Earth. Because the moon has no atmosphere, there is no wind and no rain. So the footprints which those astronauts left behind may remain undisturbed for thousands of years. The moon completes one orbit of the Earth in just over 27 days, the same time it takes to rotate on its own axis. So we never see the dark side of the moon. Perhaps that's why the moon has always been shrouded in mystery. It's a potent symbol of romance. It's said that if two lovers plight their troth beneath a full moon, they will stay together forever. The full moon also brings werewolves and witches out of their lairs. From time to time, the Earth and the moon line up so that sunlight casts a shadow of the moon across the Earth, creating a solar eclipse. At a fixed point on Earth, a total eclipse of the sun will occur only once every 360 years and they're still greeted with great superstition. Chinese celebrations try to scare away the dragon that, according to legend, has devoured the sun. Celestial events are often linked to ancient monuments like Stonehenge. Only at dawn, on Midsummer's Day, do the stones align exactly with the rising sun. Today, there are better ways of studying the movements of the planets. The modern observatory allows astronomers to look deep into space. But even the most sophisticated optical telescopes are limited by the Earth's atmosphere. The best solution is a telescope in space. The Hubble telescope is just that. Launched in 1990, it provides photographs of the stars and planets which are unique in their detail as well as majestically beautiful. Out beyond Earth, we come to the planet that has always held more hope of life than any other, Mars. It was an Italian astronomer, Giovanni Schiaparelli, who more than a hundred years ago first noticed a pattern of unnaturally straight lines on the surface of Mars. He speculated that they may be great canals built by Martians. We now believe that he wasn't seeing canals at all, just a fault in his telescope. But ever since, Mars has fueled the thought that we may not be alone. By the 1930s, it was a popular myth that there were little green men living on Mars, all set to invade Earth. And a fake report of Martian landings caused mass panic in America with a radio dramatization of the novel War of the Worlds. But in one sense, we are under constant invasion from Mars. In 1996, in the wastelands of Antarctica, scientists discovered a chunk of Martian meteorite. Embedded in the rock was what could be microscopic fossils of bacteria. Perhaps millions of years ago, there was life on Mars. There is almost certainly no life on Mars now. It's a cold, barren world, with a temperature which rarely rises above freezing. Like Earth, Mars has water, has low mists in the deep valleys, or locked into the ice caps at the poles. There are huge volcanoes, including the highest mountain in the solar system, Olympus Mons, two and a half times the size of Mount Everest. Violent storms engulf the entire planet for months on end. The 
the first probe to make a successful landing on Mars was ripped to pieces by the wind in just 20 minutes. Named after the Roman god of war, Mars appears to have a blood-red color and has always been linked with anger and conflict. People born under its influence are supposed to be fiery and hot-headed. In fact, the red coloring comes from iron oxide, better known as rust. Far from being the bloodthirsty, heroic god of war, Mars is just quietly rusting away. Although forbidding, it seems to be the only planet that carries any possibility of supporting a human colony. The ambitious plan would be to remodel the planet by a process known as terraforming. The theory is that if primitive life forms were to be introduced, they could adapt the atmosphere and eventually make the planet habitable. The process would take thousands of years, but if it worked, we'd end up with a place in space just like home. Beyond Mars lies the asteroid belt, billions of fragments of rock that some scientists believe are left over from the formation of the solar system. Fragments are sometimes dislodged from their orbit, traveling as far as Earth, where they enter the atmosphere and burn up, leaving a bright trace through the sky, a meteorite or shooting star. Some meteorites make it to the surface. This crater, a kilometer wide in Arizona, was thought to be caused by a boulder 50 meters across. And in 1972, a huge meteorite grazed the atmosphere. Had this fireball hit the Earth, it would have exploded with the force of five atomic bombs. The asteroid belt marks the limit of the inner rocky planets. Go beyond, and size and distance can hardly be conceived in earthly terms. We're now in the realm of the gas giants. Jupiter, named after the king of all Roman gods, is the biggest planet in our solar system. The first sightings of Jupiter led to a revolution in thought. In the 16th century, the Christian church had the fixed idea that humankind and the Earth were at the center of everything. But the Polish scientist Nicholas Copernicus suspected that the Sun and not the Earth was the center of the solar system. Fearing reprisals from the church, Copernicus delayed publishing his theories until he was on his deathbed. But his ideas were taken up by an Italian astronomer, Galileo Galilei. He made a study of Jupiter and its moons and it was the orbits of these moons that convinced him that the planets orbited the sun. Facing torture for his radical ideas, he publicly recanted, saying that the Earth is motionless. But his dying words were, it does move. Twelve more moons of Jupiter have been discovered since Galileo's day, making 16 in all. Everything about Jupiter is on a massive scale. The Earth could fit inside it 1,300 times. It has two and a half times the mass of all the other planets put together. These real pictures show the giant wind systems that drive gas around the planet in bands, rotating in alternate directions. The great red spot is in fact the eye of an immense hurricane that's been raging for at least 300 years. Jupiter's rocky core is about twice as big as the Earth, but it's an inferno at more than 30,000 degrees Celsius where hydrogen is compressed until it behaves like metal. If Jupiter was much bigger, the heat and pressure would trigger nuclear fusion. It would no longer be a planet, but a star. In some ways, it seems to defy our understanding of nature. As befits the lord of the gods, Jupiter 
remains a mystery. Though Galileo correctly worked out the orbits of the planets, he had no idea what kept them there, suspended in space. According to legend, the answer came to the English scientist Isaac Newton while seated under an apple tree. The apple fell to earth because of a force which he called gravity. All bodies in space exert this force, and the bigger the body, the greater the gravity. Fired with enough speed, an apple can escape the Earth's gravity and go flying off towards the stars. But at a certain height, the apple remains in balance. Too far to fall, too close to escape. It would go into orbit around the Earth. When Newton discovered gravity, he had discovered the force that keeps the planets orbiting the Sun. And it's gravity which creates some of the breathtaking spectacles of astronomy, like the rings of Saturn. These posed another great mystery to early astronomers. Galileo thought he was looking at three planets, a large one flanked by two smaller ones. Only a more powerful telescope could correctly identify the rings. Though they look solid, they're made of nothing more than ice cubes, from tiny crystals to lumps the size of a refrigerator. All of the gas giants have rings, but Saturn's are the brightest, easily visible from Earth. Like Jupiter, Saturn is mostly gas. It's a featherweight, with a density so low it would float in your bath, if you had one big enough. It also has more moons than any other planet. 18 have so far been discovered. The gravity of two of them has the effect of braiding the inner ring in a sort of celestial dance. The strange beauty of the planets has led to some fanciful notions. According to Pythagoras, the Greek mathematician, the perfection of the planet's spherical shape must extend to their sound. He believed the planets sing in their orbits making the most perfect harmony, the music of the spheres. Several of the great astronomers were in fact accomplished musicians. William Herschel was a music teacher with only an amateur's interest in astronomy. Outraged by the cost of telescopes, he built one of his own, enabling him in 1781 to discover a new planet. He named it Georgius Sidum, after King George III. But when the king lost his wits, it was decided that the blameless planet should carry, rather than the name of a mad monarch, the name of a Roman god. Uranus, the personification of heaven, the seventh planet out from the sun. Further observations of the new planet revealed irregularities in its orbit. Scientists worked out that its movements must be caused by another body. In 1846, astronomers finally found the eighth planet exactly where they expected. They named it after the Roman god of the sea, Neptune. Uranus and Neptune are often described as sister planets, even though the two gas giants are ten times more distant from each other than the Earth is from the Sun. Uranus is almost featureless, a great green billiard ball floating in space. The surface of Neptune is broken by patches of white, clouds and storm systems in the atmosphere. Its blue colouring comes from the presence of methane gas. Just as Neptune has its effect on the orbit of Uranus, an even more distant planet was thought to be affecting the orbit of Neptune. Percival Lowell, an American astronomer, searched the skies, but he didn't spot the planet on his photographs. He was looking for something huge, the size of a gas giant. It wasn't until 1930 that fuzzy, indistinct pictures finally led to the identification of the ninth planet. It turned out to be a small, rocky planet. 
It's so distant that even the Hubble Space Telescope can barely see it. The new find caught the public imagination. Suggested names for it included Atlas, Osiris, even Constance after Lowell's wife. Eventually a name from an 11 year old Oxford school girl was adopted. Pluto, after the Roman Lord of Death and God of the Underworld. On the very edge of our solar system, Pluto is so far from the Sun that it's a cold and barren world. Its thin atmosphere of nitrogen and methane may freeze completely in winter and fall as pale blue snow. It's about as unattractive a place for human life as can be imagined. Although a visit by us isn't likely, a round trip from Earth would take at least 30 years. Its single moon, Charon, wasn't discovered until 1978, and many of the mysteries of Pluto are still waiting to be discovered. Few believe that any planets exist beyond Pluto. At the outermost reaches of the solar system, it's a wasteland of small planetoids. It's the trash dump of the solar system, where pieces left over after the formation of the planets finally came to rest. Beyond the edge of our solar system is the vast emptiness of deep space. Light from the sun takes five and a half hours to reach here, but it takes over four years to reach the next closest star. And the furthest known star in the universe is a staggering 15 billion light years away. Our Earth once seemed the center of the universe, bigger than the sun. Now we know that it's but a tiny blue gem floating in space and time.